Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Queen Mary. It's, uh, it's great to see such uh, an excellent turnout for Thomas's inaugural. My name is Edmund Burke. I'm the Vice Principal for Science and Engineering. My only role this evening, apart from enjoying the lecture, is to introduce our external chair for this event. That is Professor Tony Goodman from the University of Melbourne. He's come here to host the lecture for us. Tony, thank you. Thank you, Edmund, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Well, mathematicians, as you know, enjoy symmetry, and I couldn't help but notice that uh, 17 years before the end of the last millennium was when Thomas's academic career began, and uh, today he is delivering his lecture 17 years into the new millennium, which must be of some <laughs> significance. Thomas uh, began his undergraduate studies in Germany at the University in Braunschweig in 1983. He then undertook a PhD at uh, Virginia Tech in the US between 1988 and 1991, including a year at the Weizmann Institute in Tel Aviv. He finished his PhD in 1991, which was actually poor timing because that was uh, a bad year to be looking for jobs in the US. Uh, so fortunately, Thomas applied for a postdoctoral position with me at the University of Melbourne. <coughs> I was initially uncertain when I read uh, Thomas's CV as his PhD was in dynamical systems uh, and my area of interest at that time was in mathematical models of phase transitions. Not totally disjoint but uh, certainly not uh, exactly aligned. But then I read uh, Thomas's letters of recommendation which even factoring in American hyperbole, was stellar. So I offered him a position which he accepted and in remarkably short order, he became thoroughly acquainted with the research area of the project and we worked uh, very productively for three years and Thomas made uh, many other uh, collaborative uh, works with others in, in the same department at that time. After three years, Thomas took a position in Norway in a completely different area and thereafter he took up a position at Manchester in yet another area. Fortunately, he uh, soon saw the error of his ways, repented and returned to the area of mathematical physics, algebraic combinatorics, uh, which he now still works in. He joined the staff here at uh, Queen Mary in 2004 and has produced a steady flow uh, of excellent papers and is a world authority on Q-series asymptotics. Thomas is also one of the very few mathematicians and indeed the only mathematician that I know who has a number named after him, the Takuchi-Prelberg constant, which links Takuchi numbers, Bell numbers and the Lambert W function. Thomas's research career now spans nearly 30 years and to summarise that in 50 minutes is of course an impossible task. However, I'm sure that as director of taught programs for more than five years, the impossible is by now commonplace uh, and I would like to invite uh, Professor Thomas Prelberg to once again do the impossible. Thomas. Thank you, Tony, for such a wonderful introduction and thank you to everybody who has made their way here to this lecture theatre tonight. I feel very humbled by such a wonderful turnout and um, I hope we'll have an enjoyable 50 minutes now. So uh, actually before I get started I would like to say that I'm very pleased that Tony could come here also because this is the second time in my life that, I'm, that I've seen him with a tie. He came with a tie to my wedding and now to my inaugural lecture he came with the other tie he owns perhaps. So thank you very much. Um, Okay, so let's get started, let's see if this works. And I will try to dim the lights quickly. Is this, this possible? Ah, perfect. Okay, so I will talk about approximate counting or 
rather the extended title would have been exact and approximate counting, but I think it was deemed to be too long for the advertisement, so the first bit was actually removed. Um, however, as you can see, I will spend, is the bottom visible? Possibly, I will spend most of my time actually on exact counting before I go to approximate counting at the end. In effect, I will try to make this a very publicly accessible lecture by giving a bit of historical overview over the cultural background of counting and of numbers, I suppose. Um, so before I start this, however, you see quite a few of my latter topics have to do with random walks. And even though Tony already summarized my career quite aptly, I just want to point out the random walk that my career took. Um, <laughs> don't focus on all the details, just look at the different countries, perhaps in red. And you see it took me quite a while to get here to Queen Mary. But be that as it may, let's start with a brief history of counting. And in particular, I thought it would be a good idea to start about counting and how it is connected to language. Uh, this is presumably a topic that not very many people are familiar with here, so that's at least something that everybody can learn about today. Um, so if you go into uh, the question of how do we count or how is counting related to the acquisition of language, uh, it makes sense to look at a couple of uh, tribes, remote tribes that have because of their special circumstances, developed very isolated uh, languages. So for example, in the Amazon basin, uh, the Piraha have, it turns out, a very, very, a very sparse language. They don't have plurals, they don't have singulars, they don't really bother about tenses, they don't have a creation story, they don't worry about yesterday or tomorrow, and in connection to this, they also have basically just two words denoting one and two. Or rather, if you try to study this more carefully, um, there are two words, hoi and hoi. I'm not sure I pronounce this correctly, but these two words, they almost sound alike. They can denote one or two, or depending on the context, if you have a large set of fruit, for example, you take some away, then you describe this also with the same word hoi that's used for one. So in that context, it means less. So these two numbers means one small less or too many, large or more. And if you actually try to teach these people how to count, you give them, say, five cookies and take two away, they have no concept to actually understand this. Or if you try to teach in Portuguese, um, dos, tres, they have a hard time to get beyond three or four. It's just not in their concept. And linguistically, uh, one theory is that it has to do with the fact that this language, language lacks the idea of, of uh, recursion completely. My house, my father's house, the kitchen in my father's house, the bottle in the kitchen in my father's house, you know, this kind of recursive construction that we do without thinking about it is completely missing in the language. And there is a theory, a linguistic theory, that says that this might be why they have no concept of counting. Now, some evidence supports this if you go into a different continent, on the other side of the world, in Australia. The Waldpree, an Aboriginal tribe, has a similar reduced number of words for numbers. They have one, two, and many. So you would think they are linguistically at a similar level. However, if you teach them English, they have no problems actually conceptualizing and dealing with larger numbers. So there's really something, I think, about this recurrence um, in languages that actually shapes your brain and, and shapes the ability of, of how you can deal with mathematics, ultimately. If you go to another Australian trade, I find this quite interesting. Um, and when I pointed this out to somebody, he said, oh, Terry Pratchett does just the same thing in one of his books. Um, you actually find uh, the Gumulgal. They again have two words for one and two, but they are slightly smarter. They actually combine these words to count further. So instead of three, they say to one, four is to two, five is two to one, and when you get to 11 or 12, it gets quite cumbersome already. But again, they haven't had the need to do these things. So let's jump a little bit further ahead again to a different place, Roman numerals. 
Um, so this is a numbering system of a very highly developed civilization, but it is inherently cumbersome to deal with because even though we're all familiar with one, two, three, four, five, etc., and Roman numerals perhaps, um, and when I was just explaining this to my daughter recently, I, re I realized from my childhood I remembered this combination MCLXXX, which stands for 1980. Uh, for some reason, I must have seen too many credits of movies or something like that. Uh, I had this in my brain without actually really comprehending what it meant. So, and you see it's quite cumbersome if you say want to count to 50 plus 30 plus 1 less than 10, so that's the 89 there, to 10 less than 100, which is the, um, the 90 there, the XC, uh, it gets very annoyingly hard. And you can imagine that doing simple arithmetic with these numbers is actually extremely cumbersome. So you'd rather not. And the biggest step here is really now done in the Indian culture, uh, where zero was invented or maybe discovered. I mean, there's this long-standing question of whether you invent or discover mathematics, which I don't want to go into here today. But in this context, zero served as an important placeholder in numbering systems, and it enabled you to now deal with 10 symbols to actually start counting the way we know about counting nowadays. So this is what I want to say about the language part of counting. There's, of course, of course also a cultural part of counting. Um, and culture drives the necessity to develop um, mathematics, to develop counting systems, numbering systems, bookkeeping systems, whatever you'd like to call it. So in that context, the earliest evidence we actually have of some humans possibly having counted is a 20,000-year-old bone made from the skeleton of a baboon. And you find fairly regularly spaced marks there. And there's a theory that these are <coughs> tally marks. So maybe some hunters were notching the bone every time they killed an animal or something like that. Nobody knows for sure, but this is as far back as we can go with, the, uh, with counting. So this is evidence that people back then might have counted. Now, if we jump a little bit further ahead, in Sumeria, in about 4000 BC, uh, there was already quite a sophisticated way of dealing with counting. You find this abstraction of, say, you have a couple of chickens, you want to sell them, and in order to make this happen, to have proper transactions, these chickens were then represented by uh, little cones, little clay cones, and these clay cones then were put into a pouch, and eventually these pouches had then symbols up front saying this pouch contains 15 cones or something like that. And eventually these pouches were then removed and the symbols on the, couch, on the pouches were then representing the number itself. And this then went onto clay tablets in the Sumerian Babylonian culture and so forth. So you see there's quite some abstraction going on from objects, from a set of cattle or, or fish or whatever it is, to a symbol representing this. Now, the Egyptians push this a little bit further uh, when looking up for interesting things to find about, to talk about today, I actually realized that um, there is in the Egyptian culture a hieroglyph to represent one million. So they must have had the need to actually talk about large numbers then. And when I first saw this hieroglyph, I thought, oh, this person is presumably throwing their hands up in desperation at having to count that high. Um, but uh, I guess it's basically just some, some person praying at the particular god. Um, so, a little bit further ahead then, the Pythagoreans now actually got into this whole thing with full swing. They had a very highly sophisticated mathematical culture. And in fact, it went very much into metaphysics, into um, trying to actually put numbers at the center of everything. So in, in Pythagorean um, philosophy, uh, you really find the fact that numbers are the center of all things and everything is derived from numbers. And they had certain special numbers they ascribed holy properties to. Um, so that went into a very, very um, different way. Now, unfortunately, the Greek Empire was overcome by the Roman Empire. And in the Roman Empire, you had a very inefficient numbering system. 
and mathematics was really just only used for bookkeeping. And there was quite a hiatus after this, mm -hmm. at least in Western society. I don't want to go on too much about this, but I thought this was maybe a very interesting introduction. Um, let's step ahead in full swing to modern mathematics. So what are nowadays numbers? Natural numbers, positive integers, that's what I call numbers here to simplify. And um, this uh, mathematician here comes to mind. They all, all these ancient mathematicians seems, seem to be um, a bit bald-headed bald and quite bearded. Uh, a while ago, if you remember, I tried to actually grow a long beard, but I, I gave up on that. I never got that far. Um, any idea who this might be? Anybody in the audience? This is Giuseppe Piano, an Italian mathematician from Turin, or from near Turin, and he formalized what we think of nowadays as numbers. So you can think of mathematicians using axioms as a formalization of, you may want to say, the obvious, but you have to write down precisely what you mean when you do mathematics. So this is one way of doing it. Um, so basically, the first statement is there is a number, it's just the existence of numbers, there is a number. You can call it one, you can call it zero, you can call it something else, it doesn't really matter. The next one is what you try to teach your kids at some point. If you have a number, you can always add one. There's no largest number. You know, your, your kids might ask, is there a largest number? And you know, the obvious answer to say is, well, take what you think is the largest number, add one. You get a bigger one, so there. Um, so you put this into, into an axiom. And then you have to say, well, really, there is a smallest natural number, so, or formally, one is not a successor. And then there are some slightly less obvious axioms. Um, two numbers with the same successors are themselves equal. May, maybe that one is still obvious. But then there's one that's really central when you want to do mathematics and that we have a hard time teaching our students about, which is something of that form, if you have a set that contains the first natural number, and also the successor of every natural number, then you have the set of every number. And this is the principle of mathematical induction behind here, that we try very hard to teach our students in first year. Um, and this is really where it comes from, from the understanding of what natural numbers are. So if we now understand what numbers are, let's go to counting. Counting is now nothing else but, and I think the Sumerians understood this, of matching elements of a set, matching objects to numbers. So if you want to count, say, the, uh, the object here on the, hang on, the object here on the side, uh, with the letters D, B, C, A, all you have to do is match them to the first n numbers, where n is appropriately chosen, in this case, 4. And you say, well, there's matching between the first four numbers and the, and the set of these objects. So therefore, there are four objects in the set. Or you can do it also with, with you know, the, the symbols or, or something more abstract or more concrete. And mathematicians like to put definitions on, so this will be my definition of the day. Um, so we then say, to formalize this, a set of objects of size n, if there exists a one-to-one -one map between the objects of the set and the set of natural numbers from one to n. And you can then easily extend this to countable sets and have lots of fun with these things, but that is as far, as far as I want to go here. So now, we hope we understand what mathematicians think of numbers and counting. And now we want to count something. Well, to count something, it makes sense to go into combinatorics, at least from my point of view. And you should first actually try to figure out what combinatorics is. I stole this one from Wikipedia but it's as good as a definition as anything else. The study of finite or countable discrete structures. It's a lot of abstract mumbo jumbo, perhaps, to some of you. So let's try to maybe find a couple of questions and find some examples to put this bit into life. And one question would be, well, you can talk about structures, but how do we know that there exist structures of a given kind or size? That would be one thing to think about. And, oh. This button doesn't work, I'll use the other one. So, so for example, to pick some um, rather current example, I'm sure at least half of you guys are a member of LinkedIn or Facebook or something of that sort. So if you actually 
um, take six members on LinkedIn.com. Um, does there exist a collection of three of them who are either all directly connected to each other, or are there three of them who don't share any connections? It might be a fair question to ask if you're on a social network, on some social, web, social profile website or professional website. And the answer is, in this context, yes. And the way to understand this is to basically look at a representation of this question on a graph. So here you have a graph with six vertices representing six people. And every connection is drawn as an edge on the graph. And if the connection exists on Facebook or on LinkedIn, you draw a red line. If it doesn't exist, you draw a blue line. And just by looking at this, you can then convince yourself, just by looking at this one here, you see, for example, there's a triangle in red all the way down here between Charlie, Evelyn, and Fred. The answer is affirmative. So then you can ask, and that is really where I like to come in, we go now to counting. Well, asking whether these things exist is highly important and leads to a field in combinatorics called Ramsey, Ramsey theory, for example. Um, if they exist, how many of them are there? So the next question is, how many structures of a given kind and size are there? And in this particular case, how many of these graphs are there? Now, you can actually easily do an enumeration of these. And you can, with lots of effort, draw them all. And there they are. So here, the question isn't that hard, necessarily. But if you think about it, it's actually not that easy to come up with these graphs, because in a very simple way, every edge can have two colors. And you have 15 edges in this graph. So you have two to the 15 different way, ways of coloring these graphs. So that's quite a large number. And if you go through all of them, you're going to be very busy or you ask a computer to do it for you. And then, how do you reduce this to these numbers, uh, to these figures that I showed you? Well, the connection there is that you have indeed 32,000 roughly different friend, friend strangers graphs on these vertices, if you distinguish them all. So if you keep the labels, if you keep the names. But if you say, I'm just interested in the structure, I want to erase the labels, look at the unlabeled problem, and then just exchange the edges, or sorry, exchange the vertices and see what remains. And then you end up with precisely those 78 different graphs, also keeping in mind that you can exchange colors in this question. So that's combinatorics. And that's, I think, one good example to explain what combinatorics is about. Um, of course, there are people that are experts in combinatorics in this audience, and I hope I haven't offended half of them by simplifying this so much. But I hope I'm getting the point across to the non-combinatorialists in the audience. So let's move to exact counting now. And that's what I started doing. That's what I started doing when I did the postdoc with Tony. And I actually started doing this in the context of lattice paths. So I have to briefly talk about what lattice paths are. And to give you one simple example, I'm just going to look at how many directed lattice paths with n up steps and n e steps are there. So you can think of a regular grid, a subset of the square lattice, perhaps. Think of, I don't know, a regularly built city such as downtown Manhattan in the US. And you just ask, if I'm all the way in the southwest, how do I get northeast? And how many different ways on shortest paths? And you can easily, just by exhaustive innovation, find them all. You know, for example, if you have two steps, one up step, one east step, you can either go first north or first east. And you get two of these. And then you go further and you get six possibilities of uh, configurations with six steps, with, with four steps. And you get, um, if you count further, 20 paths of length six and so forth. And then the question isn't just, can we do it for small numbers? The question is, can we actually write down an expression for general n? And here the answer is quite simple. The number of 2n steps is just the binomial coefficient 2n choose n. And why is this so? The hint is actually in the way we read out the binomial coefficient, 2n choose n. It really means we choose n steps out of those 2n steps. 
And that gives us the way of all combinations that we can write down. So in the first case, we can choose either the first or the second step to go east, in the smallest case. In the next one, we just choose correspondingly six different ways of, of doing it and so forth. And that's where this number comes from. And if you go a little bit further, what becomes extremely powerful and useful and moves you over into algebraic combinatorics or the possibility to write down equations for doing combinatorics is the counting or generating function. So here you basically sum up all these numbers. You, you add them, you multiply them with the generating variable x. So it's c0 times x, c0 times x to the north plus c1 times x to the first power plus c2 times x squared and so forth. And you add them all up. And if you do the mathematics here, you get one over the, is this visible here? It's not the whiteboard, I think. It's a problem with the display equipment. I'm sorry. I'm not sure I can actually change this. This worked fine. I tested this up in, in our seminar room. It worked fine there. Um, Oh, they didn't do, I see, hang on, let me just, how do I get out of this? Escape doesn't work. <laughs> Don't want to do any of this. Then I can't quit. Ah, that's what I wanted to start with. I thought it looked a bit funny. Apologies. <laughs> I recently went to a concert that was recorded by, by the BBC where they did precisely that because the car alarm went off outside. Um, but I don't think I want to do this here. So here you see the formula. It's, it's not anything special. It's just a very simple formula. 1 over the square root of 1 minus 4x. Okay, so let's move. Oh, now this actually, no. This actually works now as well. <laughs> I was wondering why the pointer didn't work either. Okay, so let's move on to some real research problem, which is walks in a triangle. And I'm just trying to see if my former PhD student is here. There you go, welcome Paul. So I thought you might enjoy this bit now. Um, let's start with walks on the triangular lattice. Just random walks on the triangular lattice. And you might want to ask how many walks of four steps of, of n steps are there. And this, um, this is actually a very easy problem. We have six waves to take a step in each direction on the triangular lattice, as you can see. And so therefore, for every time you step, you multiply the number by six. So after n steps, you get six to the n. And you can write down the counting function for this quite easily. It's just summing up a geometric series. And you get one over one minus six x. So far, so good. Now, you wouldn't bother with doing a PhD about this, of course. Um, so it turns out to become extremely difficult if you actually restrict this to a finite domain. Say, in this case, the natural domain would be a triangular domain. So you then, again, can ask the question, how many n-step walks are there in a triangle of a fixed side length L, starting at a point A and maybe ending at another point B? So the counting numbers are now, well, they, they look more complicated because they have different indices now, because they have all these parameters to keep track of. And you might want to say, well, can we find out a general formula about this? Now, it's relatively easy if you take a triangle of fixed side length. If you say, take a triangle of side length 20, it's cumbersome, but entirely possible to give a counting formula for this. But if you say, well, now I want to take the side length as an extra parameter, it becomes very hard. So generally, there's no closed form for these numbers or for the associated counting function known. So this, I thought, was a good starting point to let a PhD student work away on these things. And um, we actually found, to our surprise, that there, was, there were special cases that turned out to be very simple. So one thing we found out about two years ago was if you start the walks in a corner of the triangle and let them end anywhere, 
then these n-step walks can be written down with the help of this counting function explicitly. It's given up here. Um, you don't need to fully understand the details. The point is just you can write it down. It doesn't look too complicated. So this by itself may not be as remarkable, but then we looked at this for a little while and we stared at this a bit longer and we realized that there was something hiding there that we uncovered. And that was the fact that these walks are actually in a connection to bicolored Moskin paths in a strip of finite width. So these are like these north-south path or north-east paths we had before, just tilt them by, 90 degree, by 45 degrees and also allow some horizontal steps for good measure and then allow these steps to have one of two colors. And if you do this, then you can write down what is a corollary of the previous formula if you stare at it long enough. Uh, I won't show it again, so don't worry about that. Um, such that n-step walks starting the corner of a triangle of odd side length are in correspondence with bicolored Motzkin paths in a strip of a particular height. Now, the added difficulty when you think about it is these Motzkin paths have to start and end at the bottom. That's part of the definition. I didn't give you the definition, so I have to say it. Whereas the random walk starting the corner can end anywhere. And the other thing is, this is only counting function proof. So we can write down the counting function for both of these, but we have no direct way, except for very small triangle side lengths, to actually find a direct proof, a direct bijection between these. We don't have a one-to-one -one mapping. Now, if you tell this to an audience of, of combinatorialists at the workshop, you see them all pulling out pens and papers and starting scribbling away and thinking this can't be that hard, and they try to actually do it. But uh, I've been hoping somebody could find a general proof, but to date, nobody has. So if anybody's interested in this, um, talk to me afterwards. I'd be happy to give some hints of how to start. But also, word of warning, health warning to this, Paul tried for about half a year to do it and didn't get very far. I had warned him, but... There you go. So, having said this, he still did a fantastic PhD, so this is <laughs> just to make sure this is clear. Um, but I just wanted to give this as an example of the fun you can have when counting things. Right, so, but let's go to the things I'm actually really interested in, which is lattice path models of polymers. Because my background is somehow more in physics, statistical physics, one of my part lives was being a physicist, sometimes still is, and therefore I actually try to do things with the physical intuition sometimes. So here, you really want to think of real life polymers. This is a picture of polymers that have been deposited on a, on a two-dimensional surface. You can see the scale there as well. This is really just you know, the little line there is 25 nanometers. And the way to get these pictures is you go with an atomic force microscope, which is essentially one very sensitive needle that can be steered by piezo crystals across a surface and you just scan the surface and you can detect where the um, polymer is located. So I think this looks very much like linear chain molecules, possibly random walks. So you might want to study these things with the help of lattice paths. And that's what people have done. Again, physicists provide the theoretical uh, framework for this. They believe in something called universality, which basically means as long as you get the modeling right, it doesn't really matter whether you look at continuous space or if you look at a discrete lattice. And if you believe this, then you're fully justified to say, well, I take my complicated physical space, say three dimensions, and turn this into a simple cubic lattice. And if I take a polymer, kind of looks like a random walk, right? So I can model this as a random walk. And that's almost correct, except you see the words ghost polymer here. So this is a polymer that where different parts on the chain don't know about each other. They can freely overlap. So in order to make this a more realistic model, you have to do something to it. And that is you have to add the fact that like beads on a chain, you know, beads on a necklace, can't occupy the same physical volume in space. They just can't. So you have to put some self-avoidance in there 
That's called excluded volume as a technical term. And you now turn these polymers into self-avoiding random walks. And then you can actually do reasonably good approximation of physics by doing mathematics. And moreover, you can now do things slightly more complicated even and um, add extra things. So for example, you can model the quality of a solvent in which the polymer swims by making this polymer interacting and the interactions become short-range interactions in the self-avoiding walks. And that way you have a very good model for the collapse of polymers and by studying this model you get results that can be confirmed with a fairly large error bar but nonetheless can be confirmed by physical experiments. So suddenly we're doing physics using lattice paths. And you can then draw pictures like this and say this is a realistic model of a polymer. I put realistic in quotation marks because at the very end, it isn't really, but it helps to understand what's going on. And this looks quite complicated, so you now can actually model a single uh, polymer or single DNA experiments. You can glue a DNA molecule at one end to a surface, you can tether it, you can make the surface sticky, you can make the polymer or the DNA molecule, whatever it is, stick to itself, and you can uh, pull in at one end. Experimentally what you do is you attach a huge latex bead to the end of the polymer, and this latex bead is then actually moved about by an optical tweezer. So you create some uh, inhomogene inhomogeneity by strong laser light that actually traps the laser bead and allows the laser bead to be moved about and thereby allows the polymer to be moved. And you can even do it slightly fancier. This is just a two-dimensional picture. If you use an anisotropic laser bead, you can actually start twisting a polymer as well. So not just pulling it, but also twisting it. And all of these things you can model and study in these very simple lattice models. So I found this quite exciting. So I did quite a bit of this. And of course, underlying on the mathematical side is really just a combinatorial question. It's a counting question. How many configurations, how many n-step lattice paths are there with, and now we have to fix the parameters, m nearest neighbor interactions, k contacts with the surface, and ending at a particular distant, distance h from the surface. If you know these numbers, you can do something with it. Now physicists relate this to the density of states. That's what they like to operate with. And the density of states goes straight away into statistical mechanical formalism from which you can extract all sorts of interesting things that physicists are interesting, interested in. So you can link the counting to experiments at the end of the day. Okay, so let me give you one example, which is pulling polymers of a surface. So forget about self-interacting polymers and all that, it's much too complicated right now. And let's look at a very simple model. Let's make the self-voting walk directed. So let me just quickly go back here. You see over here with this picture you have overhangs. You can walk to the right or to the left. But if we make it directed, say we forbid steps to the west, we will only allow steps north, south and to the east and we have self-avoidance. And there you can now write down this model precisely. You can solve it exactly and We've done this about seven years ago with a um, postdoc back then from Australia, Julian Osborne. I think by now she's on, on the faculty of the University of New South Wales. Newcastle. Uh, Newcastle, I'm sorry. Thank you, Tony. Um, and why am I mentioning this? Because just, well, oh, sorry, I forgot. You can now actually extract from this a lot of interesting physical information. So first of all, we could say, well, there's, if you heat up the polymer, you put physical variables in, you can actually thermally, just by heating it up, desorb the polymer. If you make it hot enough, it starts swimming in the, sur in, the, in, the, in the free space. And if you conversely cool it down, it starts sticking to the surface. But then you can do more. You can say, well, if we now also start pulling on it and look at the effect of pulling, 
we get these, the surface here that separates at low temperature and low force the adsorbed state from above the surface on this side at high temperature and higher force by and large the desorbed state. And if you take vertical lines for different pulling angles here, you sort of see that if you change the pulling angle, pulling on the polar bird does two different things. For angles close to 90 degrees, so vertical pulling, you actually pull the polymer off, whereas if you pull fairly horizontally, you actually enhance the polymer absorption. And if you think about it hard enough, you realize it's actually not that surprising that this happens. There are fairly good reasons why. Um, so I think I said this. Sorry about that. But now, just last week, a collaborator of mine sent me a paper, thought, Thomas, I think you'd be interested in that. And it turns out that just about a week ago, a paper was published that took this theoretical prediction, made a measurement with an atomic force microscope. So there is the experimental setup. You have a polymer stuck to the surface. You pull on it, and it's just a very rough sketch. Um, and this is what they measured. They measured the desorption force with proper physical error bars in physical units here, piconewtons, as a function of the pulling angle. And they then said they obtained experimental evidence for theoretically predicted enhancement of polar bear adhesion while decreasing the pulling angle and cited our papers as, as the uh, theoretical prediction. So I felt very chuffed by that. And the reason is really that I'm doing this very abstract mathematics most of the time that it hardly ever happens to me that the stuff I do actually gets picked up by experimentalists. So this is one of these wonderful examples when at a very current example on top of it, I couldn't have talked about this two weeks ago, where this actually happened. So I thought it was worth putting this into the talk today. Right, so we've got 15 minutes left. So we can do about 15 minutes of approximate counting. Now this was all exact counting. Exact solutions, exact numbers, and extracting information from these. Now, the real systems are, of course, way too complicated. Even when you, walk, when you move from directed walks to self-avoiding walks that are undirected, it becomes a really hard problem. So you cannot possibly hope for an exact solution anymore. So what do you do? How do you deal with that? You try to actually look at algorithm development. So instead of trying to find exact solution, you try to find approximate solution. So just to start this off, I thought I'd show a picture of an old friend of the department, Matt Parker, who works for us and does lots of wonderful public relations work. And he, in a, in a still clip from a <coughs> YouTube video, is discussing a so-called golfing board here. So if you don't know what this is, this is essentially just a board where you throw marbles down this narrow uh, channel here. And down here you have nails in a regular arrangement that basically lead to these marbles either going left or right at random. And then down here you have some, some vertical rows where these marbles are caught. And the idea is that with this you can experimentally um, show the binomial distribution and the approach of a binomial distribution by, by um, random numbers. So, so what do we do? We start at the origin and we go to the left or to the right with equal probability. That's what these marbles do for us with these nails. You can think of it as a fair coin toss if you want as well. Um, and if you do this n times, you get every time a possibility of going two ways. So you get two to the n possible random walks after n steps. And you might be interested in the endpoint position. I mean, this picture at least seems to tell you that, you that one interesting thing might be to actually say something about this distribution of the endpoint position. Are you in the center, all the way to the right or left, and so forth. And now you can think of these things if you have horizontally your space and vertically your Galton board or your time coordinate. You can think of these as two-dimensional directed lattice paths. Or 
as a model of a directed polymer in two dimensions. So, I'm sorry, I had to bring the polymers back into this, just because that's the way my brain works. Okay, so this is a very nice toy model in which I want to walk you briefly through the ideas of an algorithm that turns out to be extremely powerful for approximate counting. So what do you do if you simply generate this random walk? You just throw a coin every time you step, and you, of course, after, uh, say, you generate 10 to the 5 samples here, you get a good approximation of the binomial distribution. It's the blue curve on the left-hand side. And these are really the number of samples that you've generated on this side. If you normalize this and look at this on a logarithmic scale, you see that you pretty much get a good approximation of this parabola-shaped object, which is the exact distribution that you should expect to get. And there are two things to learn from this. One is it works in principle. We can get this parabola. But it doesn't work at all in the end because it's so extremely unlikely to get there. Yeah, there's a 10 to the minus 15 probability to get there. You would have to generate 10 to the 15 samples, an astronomically large number, to actually get one event of this. So it's a good idea in the center. It's a really bad idea on the sides of the distribution. So you have to find a smart idea of to do something here. And the idea really is, say you want to do this, you want to get into the tails of this distribution, how can you tweak the algorithm? And now I've condensed about a couple of pages of really hard work in mathematics and good ideas into very few slides. The smart idea is you change the sampling rate to un achieve uniform sampling. If you get as many samples on the sides of the distribution as in the center, you're done. You can sample everything. How do you do this? Well, the smart idea behind this is you have a strategy called pruning and enrichment. If your sampling rate is too large, you remove configurations occasionally because you have too many of them. If the sampling rate is too small, you just make several copies of this and run them independently and you get more samples where you want them and fewer samples where you don't want them. Sounds easy. It's a very easy idea. It's not that easy to pull off in practice. But if you do it properly, that's what you get at the end. You get something on the left that looks like very unif well, fairly uniform sampling. Yeah, you, that's the same number of samples, but now for every occurrence you have about 2,000 um, samples in each bin. And you, by doing bookkeeping and keeping track of what you're doing in order to get this, you can now recover the full distribution accurately, including at the endpoints. There are some problems that you sort of can see here. At the endpoints, one issue is there's only one way into the endpoints, whereas for every other position, there are two ways to get to. And that roughly explains why you have only about 1,000 occurrences here and 2,000 there. And there's a bit of overshooting near the endpoints because the algorithm tries to compensate for it. But that can all be dealt with. Of course, you wouldn't want it with a simple model because everything is known here. You, can, you, you don't need to do it with simple random walk in one dimension. But the point is, it's a blind algorithm. This algorithm does not know what it's simulating. The algorithm has only the goal to do uniform sampling, and it achieves that. So this can be applied to a large class of growth processes. Whether you grow a directed polymer, or a cluster, or a branched polymer, or something more abstract mathematically, you can do this in quite some generality. So let's go back to self-avoiding walks now. Um, and self-avoiding walks, to be able to draw pictures more easily on the square like this. Uh, simple sampling of self-owning walks grows, works just like simple sampling of random walk, except you have to throw configurations away that overlap. So you can do this, but it becomes a very inefficient algorithm because of that, because you have to throw away too many. You have 4 to the in random walks on the square lattice, but you have exponentially fewer 
self-avoiding walks. So you have to throw away almost all of the configurations that you generate. Terrible, bad. <laughs> sorry, did I just sound like Trump? Didn't mean to. <laughs> it's so pervasive, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so you have a phenomenon called exponential attrition. Very sad. <laughs> this was on purpose. Um, so, how do you overcome this? Well, this actually is, in its infancy, an idea that goes back to the beginning of the Monte Carlo method, the beginning of thinking about how to do things on the computer. 1956, the husband and wife team, Rosenbluth and Rosenbluth, basically had the idea, well, don't do simple sampling, just only take steps that avoid intersections. Well, that's okay. It helps you a bit, but you still have these dead ends that you trap in, so it doesn't overcome exponential attrition completely. Forty years forward, Peter Grasberger came up with pruning and enrichment strategy, the one we just talked about, to add to the Rosenbluth method. And one of the art of creating successful algorithms is to find good names. So he didn't call it Rosenbluth sampling because Perth sounds worse than Perm. I think that was the reason. So Perm took off and was actually widely accepted. And then about seven years later, I added, together with my postdoc, Jaroslav Kraftschik back then, uniform sampling to this. And this is as much as I want to give details about this. Um, just to show you the proof that it works, uh, this is a picture that shows the attrition. You look at the number of started samples, and if you look at simple sampling, it's the red curve. You start with a million samples, and you barely get to 30 steps. It's just a really bad algorithm. You don't want to use it in practice. Now, if you do the, the Rosenbluth sampling, you get a bit further. You get sort of to about 300 or so. But even after that, it dies out too fast. It becomes useless. And now, the genius of this pruning enrichment method is that you can actually overcome this attrition completely, and you can keep going and going and going. So suddenly you have an algorithm that's workable, and you can use it for simulations. And I haven't quite shown you what the uniform sampling does. The uniform sampling on top of this becomes now very useful if you actually want to add parameters to this. So for example, if you want to look at interacting self-avoiding walks, where you need to count the number of nearest neighbor bonds of these n-step self-avoiding walks. So there's one example of these configurations that you might be interested in. And then, the proofs again in the running of the algorithm, so to speak, there's an example of just a 50-step interacting self-avoiding walk. And you see that you can get, uh, these are the numbers of uh, red bonds that you saw in the previous picture called energy here, because this was pulled from a physics talk. Um, and you get fairly uniform sampling here. This looks almost flat. And this is what physicists would call the density of states, or what, would I, what I would call here the counting numbers. So you get, and the nice thing is you get these numbers absolute because you start growing from scratch. You get absolute estimates of these numbers. You can now say, well, there's about 10 to the 21 configurations with 15 bonds of step fi of, and 50 steps. And you can do this fairly precisely and give error bars but I just want to show the pictures here. Okay, now that you can do this, you can turn this into something publishable, and we've done this. So this is now large-scale simulations, it takes you a couple of weeks or months to run, but you can get these counting numbers or the density of states, say here for length up to 1,000, and this is to show you that they get uniform sampling, it gets a little bit more complicated when the lengths get larger, but you can get these densities of states very nicely. And from that, physicists can now compute all sorts of curves that they're interested in, like specific heat curves. So that was a very nice step forward here. And maybe to point this out, it says it down there in the, in the final item, in one simulation, you can sample across 400 orders of magnitude. If you look at this, this is decimal logarithm. It goes from 0 to 450 on the scale. So you really go all the way up to over a vast range of orders of magnitude in the simulation. 
And to do this in one simulation is quite, quite simple. OK, so let me finish off with a few applications very quickly. And the first application I actually want to show is not one of mine, but I thought I want to show it anyway because it's an homage to last week's mathematics colloquium. You might recall the mathematicians in the audience that were, there was a talk on Thomson's F group, among other things. And it turns out a former collaborator of mine, Andrew Regnitzer, oops, took this algorithm and actually tried to study numerically whether Thomson's F group is amenable or not. I'm not going to explain what amenable is. If you went to last week's colloquium, you know. If you don't, it takes too long. And I just want to point out that they took ideas from flat perm and they did precisely this. They did simple sampling combining by pruning and enrichment of the words they generated. And they drew pictures and analyzed these carefully and said, it's unlikely this group is amenable. And actually, just talking to the esteemed chair today, uh, Tony said that he actually took this a bit further and has now even more solid evidence that this group is likely not to be amenable. Numerical evidence, but still uh, something that I think is, is pushing things further into you know, how Andrew, uh, Andrew Reckness, the first collaborator here on this paper, always says, it's a lot easier to prove something if you know it's true. So the idea is here, if you know what to go for, it might become easier to do it. So strictly speaking, it's not pure mathematics, but it actually is applied mathematics in the services of pure mathematics. OK, so the sort of things that I've been doing with this algorithm, and I've written about 20 some papers after this, the invention of this algorithm, is to actually look at more and more complicated lattice walk models or polymers. You can look at different interactions. You can put stiffness in. You can do all sorts of things. And you can look at high dimensional parameter spaces. So you, for example, you can allow for contacts and give these contacts an interacting weight. And then you see transitions. For example, if you look at this parameter of omega equals to 0.5, that's the strength of these red ones. And you now you increase the strength of these contacts you go vertically across this line, you come across a transition between the green and the blue area in space, in, in phase space, and you see that something that looks like a swollen polymer starts to locally clump up and eventually become a collapsed polymer. And the way this happens, you can understand in terms of uh, the type of phase transition that occurs in these models. So for the people who know about this, this would be a first order indic indication of a first order phase transition here. Or you can do this with different models. So you have something that's almost the same, but here you don't allow crossings, but you look at contact inter energies, at nearest neighbor energies, and you also allow for stiffness in the model. And this took an enormous amount of time to study, but we've really managed over a sequence of about three, four papers to pull this all apart, and we find different transitions here. I'm not showing you the pictures of phase diagrams here, just to give you pictures. Um, you see different types of collapsed regions. You find something that, um, not sure, looks like the surface of a brain almost. You find something that's very dense, almost like a polymer crystal. And you find something that has orientational order. So this is reminiscent of beta sheets in protein folding. You can find these different structures in the simple model, and you can find the different transitions between these. And this is still an area of active study. And now briefly, let me come back to the very last example. Coming back because I was talking about anisotropic uh, latex beads and twisting before. Um, I think the older people in the audience might recall these sort of old conventional telephone cords that always ended up in a big twist in what's technically called a supercoil. Um, others might re recall this effect with shower hoses uh, in their shower every morning. They're not careful. And this also happens actually on the nanoscale if you actually twist DNA molecules. You can do this in the experiment. And I was very surprised to hear about this about four or five years ago at the Statfist in Australia when I went to, that there was a lab in Cornell that was doing actually these experiments. And um, 
So we thought we'd model this. So this is the experimental setup. Here's our sketch of the numerical simulation. And we've chosen, in this case, the face-centered cubic lattice because it seems to sort of be a bit more appropriate to model the supercoiling. And then you can actually pull on this, twist it, make it interacting, and have lots of fun with the simulation. And in fact, however, combine the simulation with experimental work. And I think I've used up my time with this. So I think it's fitting in the very last slide to finish off with a big thank you to all my co-authors. And um, there's been quite a large number of these over the years. And the ones in color, in red, are precisely the ones that I've interacted while here at Queen Mary. And I would like to thank my colleagues here at Queen Mary, former, present, and of course, all future ones, very much. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas, for a, a, a wonderful whirlwind tour of uh, many deep and profound uh, activities and uh, applications uh, of counting and simulation. I think we have time for one or two quick questions. If uh, there's anyone in the audience who is game enough to uh, put up their hand. Yes? Um, going three-dimensional as opposed to two-dimensional? Yeah. or yeah. Well, It doesn't add, for lots of problems, it doesn't add much in complexity. It's just for, for certain phenomena. So if you want to twist something, look at three-dimensional structures, you have to do it in three-dimensional space. So then you do these things. Um, the finer point here, perhaps, is you could do these things on several different regular lattices in three dimensions. There's a simple cubic, there's the body-centered cubic, there's a the face-centered cubic. They all have different coordination numbers and allow for different lattice paths. You try to find the one that you think mimics uh, more, most realistically what you actually want to model. And in this case, we had the face-centered cubic because you've got slightly tighter coils, um, but you can you can study lattice knots or things like that on the simple cubic lattice. There you would take the simple cubic lattice because it makes the mathematical proofs a lot easier, for example. So it depends on what you're interested in, really. No other unresolved issues. It seems like you have oh. uh, totally satisfied everybody, Thomas, and everybody understands everything. So when we <laughs> hand out the examination <laughs> paper shortly, uh, there should be no difficulty whatsoever. So uh, I'd like to uh, then invite you all to uh, join me in thanking Thomas for a splendid uh, presentation and then invite you to join us for drinks in the foyer subsequently. Uh, thank you. Thank you.